Well, good morning. My name is Paulo Sotelo. I'm the director of the Brazil Institute of Miracle Worker Center. Uh, we gather today to review the very, very difficult reality Brazil faces as a consequence of acts and actions that uh, would work very well in fiction, but unfortunately are part of reality in Brazil today. Uh, following President Dilma Rousseff's impeachment last year, uh, or removal from office amidst the severe recession her administration brought to the country. We are watching now part two of the same process, which I would describe as the exhaustion of a political and economic system built on Brazil, in, in Brazil since the 1980s uh, reinstatement of democracy. Uh, I would I would say that uh, we Brazilians have no one to blame for this but ourselves. The latest episode which are struggling with right now was brought to the country courtesy of President Michel Temer. Two weeks ago, he received, late at night, at his official residence in Brasilia, a gentleman by the name Joesley Batista, co-owner of JBS, the world's largest meat processing enterprise, a company that emerged from a strategy designed and implemented under the rule of the Workers' Party of former President Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva, to promote the so-called National Champions uh, company that would be drivers of Brazil's uh, development. And they did that by pumping billions of dollars of public money from the National Development Bank especially, but others also, into projects and ensuring, in certain cases, access to federal contracts. Uh, the part of the federal contracts we know well because it is a, they are at the center of the corruption scandal involving Petrobras and construction companies in Brazil under investigation by Lava Jato. The, so the car wash operation started more than three years ago. The encounter of Batista and Temer was completely inappropriate in both form and content. The businessman had entered a plea bargain agreement with federal prosecutors and unknown to President Temer, he taped the conversation. He reported to the president a series of acts of obstruction of justice and of bribing politics, politicians that he was in the process of committing and amazingly left without being arrested on the spot or at least warned about the criminal nature of his actions. Obviously, you can imagine the reaction in Brazil, which is a country that has been in the past few years very mobilized in uh, very aware of corruption in high places and I would say, mobilized to address the issue by supporting criminal investigations like Lava Jato. Uh, the episode marked the political end of the Temer government, which doesn't mean that he cannot survive there. He can linger there. We have some precedent for that. Uh, but more seriously, it marked also a political, or at least a temporary suspension of the reformist agenda uh, that Temer brought to Brazil, and that was starting to show results. Brazil was well in the process of overcoming its longer and deepest recession, negotiations on reforms needed to address structural deficits of the public sector, such as social security reform, 
were advancing in Congress, others like labor reforms and a series of changes were also seen to be advancing. All these efforts are obviously compromised, at least from now, depending on the outcome of the current crisis. Uh, we have already 14 million people unemployed in Brazil as a result of the recession. So uh, we face the real possibility of making that situation even worse. Uh, we may also get wise enough to reverse, to do the things needed in order to reverse this. Uh, historian Boris Fausto, who was a Wilson Center fellow in the early 1980s, summarized the situation the other day in an interview, the text is available outside, saying that this is the largest and most dramatic crisis in the country's history. Boris' son, Sergio, Sergio Fausto, political science expert, uh, who joins us this morning from Sao Paulo, said last Monday at a nationally televised debate in Brazil that uh, Brazilian democracy is in intensive care. Uh, whether or how the country gets out of this self-imposed mess is our topic of this morning. We have two basic scenarios in front of us. Well, our experts may disagree with me, there may be more than two, but the basic one is that uh, on June 6, the Superior Electoral Tribunal in Brazil will or may decide on an action brought by the losing candidate of the last presidential election, former governor and senator Ayasio Neves, against the Dilma Rousseff, Michel Temer ticket, alleging that the money used in their campaign were ill obtained from corruption and therefore that the result of the election should be annulled. Uh, that case comes to the tribunal on the 6th. Two days ago, there was sort of what appeared to be a impression that the tribunal would take upon itself resolve to resolve the issue and would just uh, declare Temer, uh, Temer's election invalid and start a new process that will be debated here. Well, this morning there are news saying the opposite, that maybe the tribunal will pass. So that may be, uh, or not, a scenario. Uh, one interesting scenario by José Roberto de Toledo, a Brazilian journalist and commentator, is uh, the Sarney, to revive the José Sarney uh, scenario of, nine of the 80s. José Sarney was a vice president of an indirectly elected president, Tancredo Neves, who died before his inauguration. And he governed, uh, especially the last part of his government, without support. Uh, we had, at that moment, hyperinflation, uh, uh, necessitating some very drastic measures later on. Uh, that is also a possibility. Joining us to analyze this very difficult and sad scenario. Our dear friends of the Brazil Institute, uh, Mauricio Moura, CEO of IDEA Inteligencia. Uh, Mauricio has conducted a poll to sort of see public attitudes in Brazil regarding this crisis. From Sao Paulo, joining us are as I mentioned, Sergio Falso, executive director of the Fundação Fernando Henrique Cardoso. Claudio Couto, professor at the Fundação Getúlio Vargas in Sao Paulo. And Carlos Lins da Silva, uh, global fellow of the Brazil Institute. 
a journalist and a dear friend. Here with me and with us are Matthew Taylor, Associate Professor at American University and a former fellow here at Wilson Center. Uh, Giuliano Basili, uh, correspondent for Valor Economico and an expert on issues related to the judicial process in Brazil, having covered the Supreme Court of Brazil for almost 20 years. Uh, and uh, Monica De Bol from the Peterson Institute of International Economics, who will be joining us momentarily. Uh, I will take Monica's place until she gets here. But uh, after the presentations, uh, the Anya Prusa, the program associate of the Brazil Institute, will come here and will moderate the debate. Uh, so I would invite maybe Sergio to start in Sao Paulo, and then we go in the order you guys in Sao Paulo think it's best, and then we'll move here and we go with Matthew probably first. And we'll have, I, w I just asked our presenters to be to the point, because we have a lot of you, and we want also to leave time for dialogue with the, the audience we have here and to the audience we have online uh, that uh, may send us some questions to uh, my email or Anya's email. Thank you very much. Sergio. Uh, are you hearing me well? Yes. Okay. Let me start by thanking you, Paulo, for the invitation, saying hello to everybody. It's always a pleasure to, to talk to you. And I'll, well, uh, let me start by saying that it's clear that uh, President Taylor's uh, government is, is bleeding out, but it's not yet dead. And the question is, is it fatally wounded or it can get over uh, the, the acute crisis it's living through? I, would, I will argue here that he is fatally wounded, uh, although I admit that it's very hard nowadays in Brazil to make any kind of um, prediction with a reasonable degree of accuracy. So why is it uh, the, the administration is bleeding out, but not yet dead? Uh, I think the main reason has to do with the inability of the political class to come up with a replacement that, meet, uh, that meets two, three criteria, uh, which are nowadays very difficult to reconcile. One is a modicum, a modicum of same, some legitimacy in the eyes uh, of public opinion in, in general. The second is uh, the backing uh, of a majority in Congress, having the political support of, uh, of, the, of senators and House representatives in such a number that make uh, a government feasible. Uh, in, in the remainder of, of the present uh, presidential term. And uh, in third is um, the ability uh, to move on with the reform agenda. Uh, it's, it's really hard to find someone who meets the, this three criteria. And, uh, criteria. and the question is not one of only of scarcity of leadership, but all also, and I would like to underscore this, that um, the economic elite, the political elite, and society do not see eye to eye on what is the best solution to the president, to the present situation. What the economic elite wants? The economic elite wants more reforms, right? Um, what the public opinion wants. The public opinion is not in favor of more reforms. It, it is divided, it's reluctant, it is uh, afraid of losing more than gaining with the reforms. And the 
public opinion and society at large would like to have an outsider as the new president of the republic. But th an outsider is impossible under the current, in the current situations, um, not least of all because the constitution uh, mandates that the replacement be uh, chosen through indirect election in Congress. In Congress, what Congress wants? Does Congress want more reform? Uh, it clearly, the majority of uh, parliamentarians now uh, are not, let's put it that way, ready to pay the extra price of voting very unpopular reform under the current, current situation. So the new, the new government, the, 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 the potential new government, government is not really a promising possibility, neither from the point of view of the markets, who want someone committed and able to push on the reform agenda, nor to the, uh, to the perspective of society, who, who is clearly uh, uh, fed up with the political class and see any kind of solution, indigenous solution, as an illegitimate, illegitimate one, and nor from the perspective of the political class, who really would love to see a, a government who could give them coverage, legal coverage against the damages of the Lava Jato investigation, and or more political resources to play uh, in the next uh, election in a competitive way. But the new government or this government is not ready or able to give neither legal coverage to politicians because this will completely doom the new government in the eyes of the public opinion, nor to give them more political resources in terms of patronage and access to public funds because that will compromise uh, economic policy, which is maybe the sole pillar stable pillar in, in, in the Brazilian political situation. So what is the result of this kind of, of impasse? It, it is a sort of state of a very bad, precarious, and unstable political equilibrium. My point is that the political system is not able to find a solution by itself to this very bad, precarious, and dangerous, and unproductive equilibrium. It has to be, let's put it that way, an external factor. Either an economic shock or something coming from the, the judiciary or uh, the Lava Jato investigation. Let's consider first the economy. And, and in this respect, uh, the situation today is in stark contrast with the one uh, prevalent in the final year of the Sarney administration. The situation nowadays is much more manageable than it was in the past. And uh, one should add to that uh, remark the fact that, um, surprisingly, uh, uh, the international economy uh, is sending uh, positive signs to, to the Brazilian economy. So, it, it, although uh, the, the political situation is very precarious, although it affects deeply economic recovery, it does not necessarily lead uh, the Brazilian economy to, uh, to an, uh, an emergency situation, right? So that would uh, tip the balance in favor of Temer remaining in power. But I, as, I, as I told you at the beginning, I don't think he will be able to sustain uh, his, uh, his uh, tenure in, in office. And the basic reason is that he faces such huge juridical legal challenges. Uh, first, the, the, the decision by the, the Supreme Electoral Court I think there is a robust body of evidence that makes very difficult for the judges to turn a blind eye on the evidences, given the new political circumstances. In addition to that, it's clear that 
uh, the, the Supreme Court and Judge uh, Edson Fachin is moving fast in, in the process of investigation, investigating the president. Um, it's in no likelihood the general uh, federal attorney will present an indictment against, uh, uh, against President Timmer in, in, until the end of June. Then the, the, the Edson Fakin will have to say yes or no to the indictment and will have to resort to Congress, to the lower house, to get the authorization to start a criminal trial in the Supreme Court. Can you imagine a, a president uh, facing this sorts of legal challenges, remaining in power? I think clearly these challenges will feed into the political process, eroding uh, what is left of political support to Temer in Congress and society uh, as a whole. Just to close my initial remarks, let me just um, stress the fact that the, 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 the enormous uh, degree of judicialization of the political process in Brazil, at the end of the day, it will be in the hands of the Supreme Court to, 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 uh, to determine the dest not only the destiny of the, of the Temer administration, but also the rules of the game uh, in the transition to a new government. Because the Constitution is silent when it comes to the specific rules that should be obeyed in the election, in the recollection of a replacement of a president when the presidency and, and the new and the vice presidency posts are vacant in the second half of any presidential term. So it's it, I think this is a symptom of how how deep is the political crisis in Brazil. Uh, key political decisions are in the hands of the Supreme Court and not in the hands of the economic elite, the, pardon me, of the economic elite and of the classical democratic institutions such as parliament, uh, the executive branch, and political parties. I'll, I'll leave it here and I'll be more than glad to answer any, any questions you, you would like to raise. Okay, Sergio, thank you very much. Claudio, please go, go ahead. Okay, Paul. First of all, thanks for the invitation to be here again. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you. And hello to everybody there, especially to Marcelo that couldn't be with us last time. So it's a pleasure to see you again, <laughs> old friend. Uh, well, I almost totally agree with Sergio mentioned before me. I say almost because we have some minor disagreements that perhaps about timing. I agree with him that uh, President Temer is really severely wounded. It's very difficult for him to remain Nazi or at least to remain Nazi as uh, a strong president. As a president who will be able to carry on the <coughs> structural reforms, the very important economic reforms that was, he was trying to carry on before this final crisis. This, the last one. But I'm not so, I don't know if optimistic is the real word here, or so certain about the incapacity of this president to remain Nazi for the next period. And why this? Because I think that he has instruments to resist the Nazi. And to resist the Nazi in spite of the action of the other branches of government, of other important political actors. First of all, the first thing that everybody thought about uh, what President Temer will do after the records uh, became well known was that, well, probably the president will have to resign. And he decided to not resign. This is a unilateral decision. He, no one can force him to do that. And probably he's really decided to not do that. The second point, perhaps we can have a judicial decision about him. And we could have two different choices about this point, or two different alternatives. The first of all would be the decision of the Electoral Supreme Court. Well, if the Electoral Supreme Court decides about uh, 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 negativity to the president, about the, the ticket, or ticket of him and uh, of President Dilma, uh, well, he still can have an appeal to the Supreme Court. 
Even before that, someone can ask, some, some of the justices can ask to revise the process. If they ask to revise the process, we we'll have a longer term. After that, at the Supreme Court, again, someone can ask to revise. If they don't decide to revise, well, we can have a longer period of decision making at the Supreme Court. And when I say a longer period, perhaps we can reach the end of this year without a final decision. If you don't have a final decision about this, well, we start 2018, an electoral year, well, and it won't be so easy to make a decision of uh, 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 put this government out when the, the, the electoral campaign will be already started. The second possibility, and Sarah mentioned it before here, well, would be a decision to make the president a defendant. In a, in a process for corruption. But I think that such a process will uh, uh, be even longer than this, uh, the, the case, uh, compared to the, to the election <coughs> process itself. The third uh, alternative, uh, or perhaps the fourth, since we could consider two different alternatives uh, in judicial terms, would be an impeachment of the president. Well, again, it's not very likely that an impeachment process will run fast. And why that? We have a, a former experience with Dilma Rousseff, a very president without a strong basis on the Congress. She couldn't even have one third of the members of the House, either of the House or of the Senate. And I think that Emma has more than that. Even losing uh, 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 political capacity, even losing strength, Temer still has more than one third today. And I think that will remain with such a support in the next months. And so the impeachment is also uh, a not very likely alternative to have. And so we have uh, uh, main alternatives. None of them are likely to produce a, 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 a relevant political effect in the short term. And so the president has uh, elements to resist, and he has, a, I would say, reason. Because if he leaves office in judicial terms, he personally would be in a weaker situation, in a, in a worse situation than he is today. He can become defended not only as a president, but as a person, and he would face severe problems in this regard. And so he has reasons to resist, at least until the end of his term. He would be in a, in a, in a stronger situation to, to begin with the, 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 the court, with the general attorney, uh, his condition in terms of a future trial. And I think that this is what he's going to do. Besides that, uh, if we have a replacement, we don't have today a certain name about that. Even parties that provide support to the president don't have a consensus about who would be uh, a real supporter for the president. Well, we have the famous uh, Brazilian uh, say that establishes that we can talk about a rope in a hanging person out. Well, this is something that in such a situation says, well, how can we, for example, in the PSDB, talk about Tasso Gerestad as a replacement for the president if we still are in the coalition, if we still provide support for the president, if the party has not only interest in the uh, more and more uh, 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 unlikely possibility uh, of passing some reforms right now, because they are part of the party agenda, or perhaps keeping PMDB support in the future. How can you talk about a replacement for the president and stay in this coalition at the same time? In PMDB, again, it would be impossible to talk about this. In other parties that have severe problems with justice, again, how can they talk about this? That is, we don't have a name now that could emerge as a, a consensual name that would force a, 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 a more the, the parties to have uh, more reasons to pressure the president to leave office. And again, probably the, this will postpone a solution for term situation for the future. For all these reasons, I think that we, we, we face a very severe problem. A very weak president, a very weak government that have many reasons to stay in office that is unable now to enforce important economic reforms in the Congress that are the reason for this government to have obtained it, political support from the economic elites, from the society, from the public opinion before, but uh, that will remain obviously probably to making only the trivial economic policies.
But even the trivial economic policies are not so easy, and for a reason that Sergio mentioned before. Because to remain in a better situation till the end of this term, this president will have to bargain more and more with congressmen. And this bargaining can compromise the economic policy. And so even the trivial economic policy that could be implemented from the uh, uh, economic ministry will be weakened by such a strategy. And so this is the gridlock in which we are today. This is we, uh, perhaps the only uh, certainty that we have today is that we will live a very uncertain times. And besides that, we not only will have very uncertain times, but we can have new surprises, like the record was a new surprise, because these surprises come from uh, a sector of the political system that is not so predictable as the Congress, as the political parties, as the presidency. I mean, the judicial system and the public prosecutors. They can reveal new things, they can reveal new elements that will make the situation even more unpredictable than it is today. Okay, uh, Claudio, thank you very much. We are going to, uh, Carlos, just hold on a second, because after those two presentations, I would like to hear, give Mauricio the opportunity to present uh, the, the results of a poll that he ran for this meeting and uh, on public perceptions on this crisis. So, and then I will ask Carlos, who is a, a journalist by training, to talk about what he sees as public perceptions there in Brazil. But Mauricio, please go ahead. Good morning, Paulo. Thank you for the invitation. Good morning, my friends in Sao Paulo, professors, uh, Juliano, Matthew. It's a very sensitive time to, to run any survey in Brazil. People, for obvious reasons, are very skeptical about any, anything that comes from the government as of today. So we run the survey basic last week. It's a telephone survey, a national sample. We, we interviewed around 5,000 5, people in 69 cities. And uh, I will be very briefly running in every question that we ask. So, uh, Paulo, if you want a leadership that could bring the country together, we have Temer. Everybody thinks that he's not the one to run forward the, the reform. So, and it's incredible because this is a combination of a low popularity plus uh, people are very skeptical about the reforms and uh, Actually, they don't really know what the reforms are about. And so the combination of controversial reforms and a low popular president, so basically there is a huge majority, 92%, that says that Temer is not the one to move forward the reforms, to push forward the agenda in the Congress. Uh, so do you think, uh, with or without President Temer, the pension reform should move forward? That's another... It's interesting because most of the population are against the pension reform. I'm going to run another question later on. Uh, but most of them, don't, they don't know what's being offered about the pension reform. So you say 58% said that the reform should not move forward. One, one point that people always say in the surveys, in the polls, is that those reforms were not public discussed, public debated. So this is one of the issues that the, the majority doesn't want to, to the reforms move forward, even without Temer. Uh, it's, but when you ask about, when you, when you change the, the question and you ask, could you support a pension system that all Brazilians would be considered equal with no sector, special group, privilege or benefits? And then a huge majority, 86%, would support a pension system that everybody would be treated equal. Of course, this is not the case about the current reform that are being discussed, but if you change the question, you got a different answer on, uh, on that. So basically, I'm against the reform, but I'm in favor of being equal. So that's the... So do you think, we or without President Temer, the labor reform should move forward at this point? It's interesting that 63% should say that the labor reform should move forward. The labor reform has much more appeal as of today than the pension reform. For, for many reasons. One of them is that there's a huge unemployment rate in Brazil right now, so any hope of, of, of getting a job, especially the, the people, the population that's in the informal sector. So what I see is that people that have jobs as of today think they're gonna lose benefits 
they're going to be uh, worse off compared to the to the what they are proposing on the on the labor reform. But if you talk to the people in the the shadow economy and uh, and the informal workers, they 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 see as maybe it's a hope, maybe it's going to something going to be better. So it depends on who you talk to. But anyway, but, but everybody agrees that the Brazilian labor system are old. So that's why people are much more in favor of the, the, the labor reform compared to the pension reform. Uh, so I, I, I ask them the following. More flexibility to negotiate with employers would help Brazilians to have more jobs. Do you agree? Neither agree nor disagree or disagree. So 57% agree that more flexibility to negotiate with the employers, more flexibility in the labor market would help them to get jobs. This is something that has changed. If I asked the same question like five years ago, the, the answer would be different. But I think the unemployment wave that we, we are facing in Brazil has helped increase that <coughs> number. So, and you ask about which one is the most important reform in Brazil that should be, should be tackled by the, the Congress. The, the, the first one is the political. 35% think the most important reform that the Congress should face is the political reform. On the other hand, nobody, everyone has a different view about political reforms. If you ask any, anybody in the streets, it's like, the, it's like talking about Brazilian soccer. Everyone thinks they're their, their head coach. Everyone thinks about political reform. So political reform is a very controversial issue and as, as, as our, our colleagues know here, very unlikely to happen in the near future. I, I, maybe in my generation, I'm not gonna see a political reform in Brazil, but, but the people feel that are the most important one. The second one is the tax reform. Interesting to see that, uh, of course, taxes is something that nobody likes to pay taxes in. And in Brazil especially, it's a very complicated system as well. Maybe we should import President Trump's idea of tax reform to the one page to, to resolve the and the, the third one is labor, as, uh, as I was saying, and the last one is the pension, because there is, everybody thinks that they will have to work more to get the pension, and on top of that, the, there is a feeling that the corruption uh, from the politicians, the, that, that corruption broke the country, and the feeling, the overall feeling of the population is that they broke <coughs> the country, they, they, they got a lot of our money, now they, they want us to work more to have our pension. That's basically the narrative. And then it's interesting because the government sold to the public opinion that the pension reform is key because of economic terms, because or you have the pension reform or Brazil is going to be in a very bad economic situation. But in the minds of the people, it would be much easier to sell a pension reform that we went and privileges and, and benefits and specific groups uh, that benefit from, from, from pension different from the others. So it's the least uh, reform that people uh, want. But uh, regarding the falling sentence, another, another question about the corruption and the economy. Uh, solve the corruption problem is certainly as important as to improve the economy. Do you agree? Neither agree or disagree or disagree. Uh, two thirds or 66% say that the corruption is very important. Solving the corruption issues, keep on with the Lava Jato, uh, going after the, cor the, 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 the corrupt politicians, it's, it's as important as saving the economy. So it's still, I, I, I run this question like one year ago, two years ago, so people has a huge support for the corruption uh, fight, real support for the Lava Jato, despite of the, the economic externalities that, that potentially that could provide to the, to the Brazilian overall economy. And this is something that, uh, that, of, of course, they haven't changed over time. So the support for, for Lava Jato, the support for the corruption uh, fight have, hasn't changed. So that's basically what, uh, what I run. And uh, Paulo. Thank you, Mauricio, very much. And uh, Carlos, go ahead and, and give us uh, your perception of the mood there. And then we will, after your presentation, we will hear from our colleagues here. Carlos Eduardo Lins da Silva. Oh. Uh, thank you, Paul. Uh, I would like to introduce some notes of, uh, I would not say optimism, but uh, not uh, apocalyptic as we are mostly being in Brazil uh, lately. Uh, some uh, reality checks 
Brazil, in uh, our history, has been able to solve all its major problems in a negotiated fashion, very differently from other countries in Latin America. So if you go into Brazilian history, you see that uh, this does not mean that it's the best solution ever. Maybe it wasn't, but it's always a negotiated and relatively peaceful way. We uh, got our independence this way, we ended slavery this way, we changed from monarchy to republic in this way, uh, we uh, came from dictatorship uh, to democracy in this way. And uh, I, I think we are living another key moment in our history, no doubt, and I'm very hopeful that we will find a negotiated and relatively peaceful solution for it as well. If you see, we have been uh, uh, watching almost daily massive demonstrations in Brazil since 2013. No one single person died during these demonstrations. If you compare, for instance, with Venezuela, uh, you see that it's a very different picture. Of course, there is no assurance that uh, someone won't die this Sunday in, in the next uh, uh, wave of demonstrations. But uh, I, I'm hopeful, I'm confident that uh, we will keep being uh, uh, able uh, to negotiate a way out for this present crisis and uh, a way out in a peaceful way. Uh, secondly, again going back into history, if President Temer is a weak president, it's not our first. You refer to Sarney, I could refer to Hermes da Fonseca more than one century ago, and I could refer to Itamar Franco himself. Uh, during his uh, initial one year in office. So uh, we can deal with weak presidents, with very weak presidents. Uh, I, I think we are able to deal with very uh, stock situations as uh, we live now for relatively long periods of time. I'm not going to guess what's going to happen with Temer. I, I don't know. Nobody does. Uh, anything can come up from the car wash again. Uh, he may decide to resign from one day to another. It was much easier to predict what would happen with Rousseff than with him. Uh, he's a much more enigmatic figure than uh, Rousseff West. She was much more transparent. Uh, we knew that she would never resign. We knew that she would fight until the end. Uh, she's still fighting. She just introduced a, a new appeal to the Supreme Court to, uh, to nullify uh, her impeachment, uh, based on the grounds that the Joyce Lay's regulations show that it was a coup, it was not an impeachment. So, uh, Temer is unpredictable, uh, for me at least. So, uh, even if he stays, or if he does not stay, my belief is that uh, we are going to get into the election in 2018, in a relatively uh, quiet way. And the country will be not destroyed until then. Uh, uh, everybody who lives uh, dramatic situations as we are now uh, have the tendency to say that this is the end of the world. I hope I'm right saying that it's not the end of the world. It's not the end of Brazil. I was, uh, the day before yesterday, in a meeting of the U.S.-Brazil Business Council. Uh, it, we know that uh, uh, capitalists don't uh, throw money away. Uh, there were scores of uh, executives of American companies there uh, still betting on Brazil. We know that FDI uh, has been bigger last year than uh, almost ever before. Even this uh, first quarter, FDI was very big, larger than the year before. Uh, Nobody, I think, uh, who uh, has interests in Brazil doubt that Brazil, on the long run, will pay off. So uh, I, I would advise uh, some more uh, prudence, including to our friends journalists. I was amazed last Wednesday uh, seeing the coverage of the protests in Brasilia. Uh, Brasilia is in flames. Brasilia was not in flames. Uh, one building in Brasilia was uh, partially in, in blames because of the action of uh, 25, 30, 100 people at the most. 
uh, and the, 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 the media was uh, saying to the people who were not in Brasilia that Brasilia was in flames. It was not. So I would advise some more calm, some more moderation uh, in the apocalyptic field uh, about uh, our country. We will survive. Obrigado, Carlos. Uh, just to uh, add what you just uh, mentioned, uh, I was on a television program the other day in Al Jazeera, and someone was talking about the mobs in the streets of Brazil, and they showed something at Avenida Paulista, and I immediately identified and said, there are n there's no more than 250 people there. I know that place. I go there all the time. So uh, I would... Uh, you know, reinforce what uh, Carlos have, uh, ha has just said about uh, it's a very nice, easy narrative for a journalist, especially, and there are new correspondents and people coming that don't know Brazil. It's, uh, and Brazil is Latin America, and Latin America is always a mess. So people go with those images without understanding what they are seeing. As Carlos mentioned, uh, uh, we have a negotiating soul in Brazil. The problem is that sometimes we negotiate even the things that are not negotiable. And that is the problem. But with that, I would like to invite our dear Matthew Taylor uh, to give his presentation. Monica should be here any moment, and uh, this is her place. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you, Paulo, and uh, hello to everybody in Sao Paulo, and uh, thank you for having me here. Um, I guess I want to just start by commenting on what Claudio and Sergio, Sergio have said, uh, and then I, I want to raise another issue, which is what judicialization is going to cause, and, and I think maybe that can be the segue to, to your presentation. But on the, on the political side, I, I think I come down on the side that, that Claudio has put forward very nicely here, and that is that, that Temer has made a very calculated decision to remove resignation from the, the list of options, uh, and his calculation seems to be that he can string out the execution uh, or his, his removal from office. And in, in, I, I'm not predicting that he'll survive necessarily, but I do think that time is on his side. We're 16 months away from the election. The election campaign needs to start up fairly soon because this is the most open election campaign of Brazilian history that I, uh, of, of the most recent uh, democratic process in uh, democratic regime in Brazil. And I agree uh, with Claudio that, that he can probably uh, string this out in part because the needed opposition to remove him, the popular opposition, is not there. And, and so when you look at the streets are active, but they're active in the way that, that uh, we've just described. And, you know, you're not seeing protests at the scale of 2013. Uh, at the same time, the economic elite is not necessarily opposed. And, you know, it's always difficult to talk about the economic elite, but um, m my impression from afar is, uh, you know, you have new cases emerging every day against uh, new business people. Uh, this week, a uh, supermarket ma magnate was, was named um, in one of the, you know, the, the investigations. And, and so I just don't know to what extent uh, the elite will consolidate behind pushing him towards the door. What this means, though, is that uh, this will be a huge stress test for the Brazilian judiciary. And the Brazilian judiciary has been through an enormous stress test already since the emergence of the Lava Jato investigation. But I want to suggest to you all that it's going to get worse before it gets better for the courts. And there are a few things that I think are going to, in this, you know, in this next six months before the end of the year, before the campaign gets going, that are going to really put a lot of strain on the Brazilian courts. Uh, as, as my colleagues have already mentioned, this is likely to go to the TSC very soon, uh, but the, 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 the TSC being the superior, uh, Supreme Electoral Court. Uh, but the, any TSC decision can then be appealed or potentially could be appealed to the Supreme Federal Tribunal, the High Court. So, you know, that's already going to be a stress and a strain. Um, 
the, the second issue there is that there's a lot of question about what the TSA, and I'll let Giuliano talk about this, but you know, would, the, would a judge on the TSE have the guts in the face of public opposition to actually put a hold on the case? Uh, in, in Brazil, the pedido de vistas is a frequently used to just slow down cases, to put them aside for a little while. Uh, and then any case uh, in the other alternative, if a, if a criminal indictment were brought, as Sergio mentioned, uh, that would go to the STF, and that would be an enormous strain. In, in addition, though, I think we need to be thinking about a couple of other strains that may be increasing on the judiciary. The first is, We've seen uh, through Temer's moves r this past week in the Justice Ministry increasing pressure on the federal police, and that could be very significant. Uh, we've seen continuous pressure on prosecutors in Brazil uh, across the board, and I think that we're likely to see that continue. It's going to be exacerbated by the fact that uh, Rodrigo Janot, the head of the, the Ministerio Público, the head of the prosecutorial service, is departing office in September. And so there's going to be a very complex sort of political m maneuvering going on there. And it's going to be complicated, I think, by the behaviors, the very public the tradition of very public behavior by Supreme Court justices. And I'm not saying that he is the only example of this, but Gilmar Mendes, uh, I think in the last month, has been in the press excessively for his own good, um, but, but certainly this suggests some of the problems that are going to be happen as politics are going to be happening. As politics moves into the courts, the courts tend to become politicized. And Gilmar has not covered, Gilmar Mendes has not necessarily covered himself in glory. Uh, some of the, the stories that we've seen this week, his wife's firm is working for Aiki Bachista, one of the tycoons that's being accused. Uh, his um, school, I guess uh, the IBDP, is doing an event later this month with Michel Temer in an event that's being sponsored by the government. So there are these very complex ties between necessarily political Supreme Court justices, but they're going to cast some, some question, I think, and, and definitely put the judiciary under, under considerable strain. So I'll leave it there. Well, thank you. This, this I think, uh, it, you, 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 you prepared the way well for Giuliano to give his assessment what will happen, may happen in the courts, and then we will move to uh, Monica, who will give us m more of a panorama in terms of the economic situation. Thank you, Giuliano. Thank you, Paulo. Uh, it's such a pleasure to be among uh, such nice experts. So I try to give a perspective of, of what is going to happen in our superior electoral court next week. is a decision that everybody is waiting for. And I used to cover uh, TSE for many years, for almost 20 years, and there is one thing that I learned from this job is that it's very difficult for the, for the judges in Brasilia to take a decision that they don't know how it be fulfilled. So they are very concerned about the enforcement of their decision. And by now, uh, imagine if TSE uh, just... Uh, decided that Temer must go, must leave office. So uh, how this is going to, to be enforced? Uh, who is going to be the president? Uh, how are we going to organize ourselves in Brazil to, to the next election? Is it going to be uh, an election made by the Congress or by the people? So there are many questions. And who is going to be the candidate for this election? In, in Congress, for example. Is it going to be Nelson Jobim, former Chief Justice of Brazil? Is it going to be uh, Henrique Meirelles, our finance minister? So my sense is that uh, the judges of, of this court, they are going to wait a little bit to see uh, how the ongoing negotiations uh, are uh, in the side of the political establishment in Brazil. So we know that uh, there are uh, uh, some uh, talks among uh, important leaders in Brazil. Uh, 
and, I, and if I may, Carlos Eduardo mentioned about uh, the work of the press. I, I really wish to read more stories about this negotiation because I think that this is the story now in Brazil. Uh, so I, I really would like to know uh, what is uh, former President Fernando Henrique opinion about this, Lula's opinion about this, uh, also Temer, who Temer is talking to. I heard that he was talking to Fernando Henrique, but we really don't know yet. What is the position of Hena Calheiros, former president of the Senate, that now is, is uh, acting in opposition uh, from Temer? So uh, I think that this is the story now in Brazil for us to cover. W one of the stories, because we have like biggest scandal in the world regarding corruption. And I, I also, uh, it also claimed my attention two statements of this week uh, regarding this decision that is going to be uh, uh, taken by TSC. Uh, one of them was made by Gilmar Mendes, who is the president of, of the court, and he said uh, to the politicians uh, that they must solve their problems and that they must not wait for the courts to solve political problems. Uh, from my point of view, that was a clear uh, indication that Gilmar Mendes and maybe other judges of, of TSC are waiting for this ongoing talking among the political establishment in Brazil. And the second statement was made by our new Minister of Justice. As you know, last Sunday we just had a new Minister of Justice in the country, which is Torquato Jardim. He's a former minister of TSC, so he's very specialized in, 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 in the court. Uh, he he knows a lot about electoral uh, uh, affairs in, in Brazil. And, and he said that maybe we are going to have a, a request for vista, pedido de vista, or a, a delay in the decision. He, he said that it is perfectly normal in, in a court like TSC to have this kind of, of delay. And if we look at the case that they are going to decide uh, starting on June 6th, uh, if you look at, at, at the judge, uh, Herman Benjamin, who is conducting the case, so this guy, he wrote a report, uh, I think it's bigger than 1,000 pages. So this is not going to be simple. And they, they schedule uh, only for the beginning, uh, for, uh, they schedule for the, this trial, only for the beginning of the trial, four session in three days. So it's, it's definitely not going to be a simple thing. It's, it's, not, it's not, as we used to say in Brazil, it's not trivial. Uh, I think that there is a, a, a higher uh, possibility for them to delay not only because the case is complex, uh, and I think that it's, it's not only the first time in Brazil that we are going to, to decide a case regarding uh, the present and the vice president mandate. So there are many questions involved. If they are going to separate uh, the case of Dilma Rousseff from the case of Michel Temer, uh, and all of that are going to create precedents for the future, so they are going to also be aware of that. And but most important of all, uh, they are not going to take uh, a step, you know, uh, a so big step like uh, taking present out of office without knowing how this is going to be enforced in the country. And with that, I think I can pass to Monica to discuss the maybe the economic implications of the crisis. Well, thank you. Thank you, Paulo, for inviting me again. Thank you to the Brazil Institute and to the Wilson Center. Thank you to my distinguished colleagues on the panel. I apologize for being late. Um, as Paulo is always very foresighted about things, this um, today, this morning, the GDP for the first quarter has just come out. This is part of the reason why I was delayed um, in coming. So let me speak a little bit about that because um, it's topical, it's timely, and it has to do with a lot of this discussion. 
Um, I think we can pretty much divide what's happened in the last three weeks or so as, you know, the Temer government being split into the pre-Joesley period and the post-Joesley period. And they're very different. Um, and I think my colleagues have um, been speaking of, you know, all of this, all of the implications of this post-Joesley period. But let me say a couple of words about the pre-Joesley because that has to do with the GDP figures that have just come out. So GDP um, apparently has grown 1% in the first quarter of 2017. I say apparently because at the moment there is a very um, confusing discussion, um, as if you know things weren't confusing enough in Brazil, as to whether GDP actually grew 1% or half a percent. And this is because B, um, it, the, the National Statistical Office has apparently changed its methodology so um, there's a question mark as to what has actually happened to the pre-Joesley GDP. And it's not trivial because given that the whole country is currently working under this sort of conspiracy theory kind of environment, whether GDP grew 1% as the National Statistical Office just reported or half a percent as most market participants have actually calculated it to be is not really exactly trivial. The um, first quarter GDP figures have um, obviously become highly politicized. Government officials have immediately come out to say, this is it, the recession's over, here's how things were going, we shouldn't derail things because the economy was doing really well. Well, as it turns out, when you break down the GDP figures, you see that most of the reason for GDP growth, whether it was half a percent or one percent, had really to do with agriculture which is seasonal. I mean, it has, agriculture has a big impact in the first quarter GDP fig figures every year. Um, and then, you know, that effect dies off. So the, when you look at the overall picture, what we see is, you know, growth that's been driven largely by the one sector in Brazil that's been doing relatively well. Um, it is, by the way, the Joe Esley and JBS sector. Um, so we should just, you know, be clear that that, that is what we're talking about here. Um, at the same time, we, we can't expect this to continue. Everything else, when you look through the GDP numbers, everything else was in the red um, on the production side, with the exception of a very, very slight uptick in, in, um, in, in manufacturing, but it was really slight. Um, and when you look at the demand side, the big reaction was on exports. But then again, that just reflects, you know, agriculture and, you know, that, that being a big part of our exports. Um, that's why exports did rather well. Consumption is still going down. Investment is still going down. So everywhere else you look, even in the pre-Joesley period, things were not great. So moving on to the post-Joesley period, which is where we are, um, it seems, as my colleagues have just described, that we're again facing this period of complete uncertainty as to what's coming. In a sense, I'd say that the, the uncertainty is even worse than it was during the time that um, the impeachment process was going on um, with um, Dilma Rousseff, because at least then there was a path forward, more or less. I mean, people have map, mapped out things in, in relation to what had happened in the past in the early 90s with the color impeachment. Circumstances were obviously completely different, but nonetheless, there was a benchmark that you could compare to, whereas this situation right now has absolutely no benchmark, as I think some of my colleagues were stressing very clearly. So that means that there's this veil of uncertainty once again um, in the Brazilian economy. That has already been captured partly by the markets, although markets in Brazil are still expecting that some swift solution is going to be found. Um, I'm with my colleagues in thinking that maybe markets are overly optimistic in terms of you know how the the situation is likely to evolve going forward, which basically means that you know if we if we take that view, um, one should expect things to deteriorate in the coming months, um, economically speaking, for. Um, for Brazil and not to improve. So I find it a little bit premature for government officials and in particular the finance minister to be out there saying that the recession is over just because there's been this uptake in GDP in the first quarter. 
um, just to remind everybody, the we you call the, the way you call a recession and the end of a recession in Brazil is the same way that you call it here in the U.S. So here in the U.S., it's the National Bureau for Economic Research, the NBR, that's responsible for calling recessions and the end of recessions. And it's usually, um, you know, you need to have two periods of consecutive growth in order to say that a recession is over. Um, this is certainly not the case in Brazil. We haven't had two quarters of, you know, um, consecutive growth. We've had one and will likely not have another, um, given the state of affairs um, in the political arena, which has a big impact on, on the economy. On the reform efforts themselves, which is the one thing that people have been trying to to you know figure out what happens now you know what happens now with the social security reform what happens now with the labor reform what does it do to you know unhinging the sort of scenario going into 2018 um, my own personal view on the reforms is that even in the pre joe esley period reforms had already been watered down to such an extent and especially social security that there was no guarantee even if you were doing the numbers um, prior to this latest political scandal that you know fiscal sustainability would be restored in the medium term um, that's something that actually a lot of people i think were refraining from doing in brazil people were just banking on reforms for the reforms them themselves but they were not actually calculating what kind of, of medium-term impact the reforms were going to have um, by, you know, some calculations that I did. Um, what they show is that unless you made some very, very optimistic assumptions about GDP going into the medium term, the current Social Security reform as it stands was not going to restore medium-term um, sustainability. So Brazil was still in a quagmire even before the pre joe Esley, even in the what I'm calling the pre joe Esley period, more so in the post joe Esley period, because as we have been seeing lately in the press, there have been some congressmen coming out and saying, oh, perhaps we'll pass, you know, an even narrower social security form than the one that we currently have. Perhaps we will only pass, you know, the, the, the retirement age. Um, in the in in what's coming in the congressional discussions, of course, having a retirement age in Brazil and not just having one but raising it to 65 years is is important, but does not solve our medium term problems. And in the middle of the, of all this, we're left with a situation where, really. The fiscal accounts have not been fixed. Brazil still has a primary deficit of somewhere around 2.5% of GDP. That number could actually rise in 2017, depending on what happens to the economy. So assuming that we are not out of the woods in terms of the recession and that possibly you know, the economy is going to be stagnant or even is going to post another slightly negative growth this year because of the political problems that the country is facing, um, certainly we're not going to reach you know, 2.5% of GDP in terms of a primary deficit. It will probably be somewhat worse than that. And looking out into the medium term, there are currently no policies to deal with this because one thing that the Temer government never did, and, e and this is the pre-Joe Wesley um, Temer government, was to actually do something for the fiscal accounts in the short term. There were a number of things that the Temer government could have done. One of those things would have been to remove all of the tax breaks that um, President Rousseff introduced in 2012, 2013, and 2014. Um, these tax breaks did nothing for the economy except be very, very harmful to government revenues. And the Temer government refrained from doing this, from reverting these, these tax breaks at a time when it actually had the political capital to do so. So it was a very bad call. And we are now sort of reaping, you know, the, the, the unfortunate um, outcome of that, which means that, you know, there's, there's essentially no hinge to the fiscal accounts looking ahead. It's therefore no wonder that ratings agencies have currently put Brazil on negative credit watch. Um, it's not entirely due to the political crisis. It's a lot to do with some of the things that I've just said. You know, the fact that there is no, there is no fiscal um, plan going, going forward. The so-called bridge to the future simply doesn't exist. It's in people's imaginations at this point. 
Um, and there is no clear strategy either. So um, what, what strikes me currently is that we are sort of in a, in a kind of a scenario that is very reminiscent of Dilma in her late days right before she was impeached. In other words, in a scenario where there's no strategy, clearly, for dealing with the situation, where the government is hanging on you know, a few straws to maintain its support, um, it's not clear that that support is going to be there. On the other hand, there is this unprecedented situation that we don't know what comes next. So that might be a reason why the government hangs on, simply because people don't know exactly what the alternative would be. But that is pretty much the worst outcome that we could have, because that means that we will have you know, this, this sword of uncertainty hanging over the economy until the elections in 2018. And by then, the kind of levels of dissatisfaction, anger, frustration that you see amongst the population in Brazil could really backfire in the polls come the general elections in 2018. I think the, the one thing that Brazil does not need is for another savior politician to come in um, with a bunch of crazy policies and you know a sort of an anti-reformist stance. We certainly do not need to see that again in Brazil, but the risks of that, in my opinion, are certainly rising. So I'll finish there. Thank you, Monica, and thanks to all of our panelists. I think this has been very interesting so far. Um, because of the time, we're going to open it straight for questions. I would also like to say for those of you who are watching online, you can send questions to our Twitter handle, at BrazilInst. I'll be checking that. So we start here in the front. And if you could just wait for the microphone, and please state your name and affiliation. Thank you. Uh, my name is Anita Fiori. I work at the Inter-American Development Bank. And my question is actually for uh, Sergio Fausto. Uh, you said in your speech, you said that you see two ways out uh, of this crisis. One, either an economic shock, as you mentioned, something, an external factor like an economic shock, or a ju judiciary uh, solution. Now that I hear Giuliano and Monica, I think neither of them are likely to occur. So then, uh, my question is, the negotiated way out is the only way out, or social unrest is another way out? Um, what do you think? Oh, if you could hold on, I think we need to switch the sound over. Uh, yes, that's working now. All right. So, um, yes. Uh, well, let me let me insist on the point that some kind of an, uh, uh, external factor is needed um, for the political system uh, to get traction and find a solution to the to the present uh, gridlock. Um, I think we are, um, I agree with my colleagues who emphasize, let's put it that way, the complexity, the procedural, the procedural and political complexities of removing tenure. But I wouldn't underestimate um, two things. First, um, the federal prosecutors know a lot of things that we still don't know. And and they act strategically, right? Um, so they they have a they have a strategy in their mind, and they and they try to take every step according to that uh, to that uh, strategy. Um, second, um, there is growing political pressure from within the coalition. Uh, to leave President Temer in, in administration. And the fact is, and the reason is, uh, the political cost of sustaining uh, President Temer in government is rising uh, the closest we get to the electoral season, because society has already passed its judgment on the government. So I, I think we, it, it is, is it if 
under normal circumstances, I think the 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 elements pointing to uh, the to a very protected judicial process, and that uh, being in favor of Timur uh, remaining in power, this argument would 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 be uh, stronger than under the very extraordinary circumstances we're living through. Uh, and the, because today, in contrast with any situation in the past, we, we have a, a totally different ball game with new actors, and the two main protagonist actors are not only the Supreme Court of Judiciary, but uh, the prosecutors, the federal prosecutors. And that changes all the rules of the game and the logical and the dynamics of the political game. And, and, and that's my, it's an instinct that I have that the, that the, the political, situ, the political uh, situation is untenable in the, in, for, for Timur. How long it will take for him to be removed, it's hard to predict. Uh, but I, 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 my point here, let me just finish, is that I think my colleagues are underestimating uh, um, how unstable the situation is and how much this political judicial process will fit into the political dynamics and will further erode uh, the political support of President Timmer. All right. Um, here in the middle. Hi, my name is Fernando Furlan. I'm a visiting scholar at the Washington College of Law, American University. Um, I heard uh, Giuliano and Monica, uh, especially on how the justices at the Superior Court of Electoral Tribunal in Brasilia are worried about uh, the afterwards of a decision they would take. Uh, but the question is, and I also heard from Sao Paulo that Brazil has a tradition on peaceful negotiated uh, solutions. So, but what is the case if the, ju the justices at the Superior uh, Electoral Tribunal find out uh, relevant evidences of uh, irregularities on the uh, political campaign of 2014? And so they would not take a decision uh, to annul the, the, the election and wait for a negoti negotiated uh, political solution? What, what would, would the outcome be in that case? Or they would be uh, uh, you know, postponing the decision until a political decision is, is, is found? Thank you. Uh, no. Let's take one more before we go. Uh, I have two, two questions. Uh, one is what uh, possibility does uh, uh, the president have to influence uh, the appointment of the new prosecutor, uh, assuming that it goes up to you know, September, that it doesn't fall uh, before? And the second is, uh, I mean, uh, how much is the sort of popular, uh, say, um, you know, dissatisfaction with Temer uh, or uh, the willingness of people to uh, see, uh, agitate to see him throw out, uh, being affected by the fact that the main uh, other parties, I mean the PT and the PSDB, are equally implicated uh, in, this, uh, in, in this political uh, mess and, and the corruption scandal. All right, so who would like to go first? <laughs> yeah, if I may. Well, uh, the decision of uh, the new Attorney General is I it's going to be in the hands of Temer completely. For the last, let me say, since 2003, so for the last 14 years, uh, all the presidents, they choose the, the first candidate in a list, this list is done by, uh, n by the National Association of Federal Prosecutors, but it's an informal list. 
is, is not the least regulated by any law in Brazil. They, they organize by themselves some debates among the candidates, and they choose like three names, and they deliver this list to, to the presidency. And since Lula took office, all the, the, the presidents uh, choose the first name on the list. And yesterday night, I was hearing an interview with the new Ministry of Justice, and he said that it would be perfectly normal in Brazil if the president choose a name that would not be in the list, be out of the list. So that indicates w uh, what may uh, happen uh, with the new attorney general. Uh, I also must add that the new uh, Ministry of Justice, I think it's, it's part of a movement of Temer, and he's resisting. I think Claudio Couto mentioned, uh, mentioned here uh, just well how the president is resistant to, to renounce. Uh, the guy really wants to stay in, in his chair by now. So uh, he, he put uh, is not only a minister of justice, is a lawyer, is a lawyer for him. And he put this lawyer at the <coughs> same time that uh, TSE is discussing this, this big judgment. So uh, that also reminds me, if I may, reminds me when uh, President Lula ask former Minister uh, of Justice Marcio Thomas Bastos to deal only with this case in Mensalon. So uh, before Mensalon, we had a Minister of Justice Marcio Thomas Bastos. And after Mensalon, Marcio Thomas Bastos went for the number two in the Ministry of Justice and said to him, now you're going to deal with the ministry because I'm going to defend Lula. So I think Torquato Jardim is this guy, is the guy who is with this mission to defend President Temer's uh, 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 chair. And going to TSA, I think that we are going to hear a lot about wrongdoing in the uh, 2014 campaign. And so it's going to be like four sessions and expect to hear uh, the worst things that you, you, you hear in, in Brazil, expect to hear about many scandals. Uh, for example, we know that uh, there was a company uh, in Mato Grosso who worked for the campaign in São Bernardo do Campo, where uh, Lula is very strong with, uh, with the voters. So how they pay a company uh, in Mato Grosso, which is more than, uh, I don't know, 2,000, two kilometers uh, from São Bernardo do Campo to work there. Uh, we're going to hear about some other companies that uh, Dilma and maybe PMDB, the, par the party of Temer, paid uh, and these companies, uh, they, they don't, don't they, they, they are organizing a bakery, you know, they are not, they are ghost companies. So we, we are going to hear about many wrongdoing during the, the campaign. And in that point, I think that Furlan is right, uh, because that is going to put some pressure for the justice of TSA to do something. But I'm, I'm going to sustain my point of view that they are not going to take a decision uh, without knowing what is going to happen next, because uh, knowing the, the ministers of the superior courts in Brazil, they have a very strong a sense of institutional responsibility. So uh, I know that at the same time they must do something because they are discovering a, 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 a bunch of wrongdoing in, uh, in the electoral campaign. But, uh, but uh, on the other hand, they must know what is going to happen if they just took Temer out of office. So uh, that is going to depend of the political negotiations, and that's why I think that is, is the biggest uh, story uh, for the press to cover nowadays. Any other, any other comments on that? Yeah, just one quick comment um, on that same question. The I'm, I defer completely to my colleagues on issues pertaining to the electoral court and to the Supreme Court. I'm no expert on I either of these things. Um, but on the effects on the economy itself, whether the process drags on, as is Giuliano's view, or whether there's some kind of swift resolution, um, what I'd like to say is that uh, either, either any of these two scenarios, 
we would still face the same kind of uphill battles on the economy, on the reform effort, and everything else that um, we currently face. So putting that in context, what it means is that for those people who are currently sitting out there and thinking, oh, there will be a swift resolution, and then we can kind of go back to that idea that reforms will be passed and everything will be just fine and we're in the same world that we used to be, no. There's been a rupture. Clearly, there's been a rupture. And even if reforms are passed, I'm just overstressing myself now, but even if reforms pass, they will now pass in even more diluted form than they've already been um, placed in, which does not bode well for um, what's going to happen to the economy in Brazil going forward. Yes. And then I think Sergio Fausto also wanted to say now, something. Now, Justin, Sergio, if you could comment on this. We know what happened if the TSC would, on what's three days session, 9 of June, decide that, yes, we found evidence and uh, go. Temer is no longer president. We know what the law prescribes. The Constitution says the Speaker of the House becomes president. For 30 days. For 30 days to the, with the mission of organizing indirect elections uh, for uh, the presidency. Uh, so I just wanted to put it there because it does, it, it, this madness has uh, a screenplay. <laughs> so. Uh, can I just add uh, one point here? Oh, I'm sorry, Sergio. Go ahead. Can I? Yeah. To just to stress, well, uh, just to stress my, my prior points and to shed light on, on and two or three things. Uh, the first one is that I agree with Giuliano that uh, uh, judges in the superior tribunals in, 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 in Brazil tend to be very, let's say, conservative, very uh, concerned about the consequences of their decisions. But look, uh, one has to take into consideration that the institutional and personal costs of turning a blind eye to such a robust in a scandalous body of evidence showing that there has been a lot of wrongdoing in the in the in in the elections of 2014 this is a tall order for any judge in any part of the world so first second um monica mentioned and i agree with her that there is an over uh, optimism in the market and we know how fragile this sort of bubbles of optimism are. And when uh, uh, reality comes, uh, uh, the, the adjustment to a, a, a new perception tend to be, to be abrupt. And this is another element that can be proved to be a tipping point in the, in the, current, in the current situation. And third, in regard to the, to the question raised by Teresa, um, it, it, it is true that there, it's not mandatory uh, for the president to choose the first and the least of uh, the uh, candidates to, uh, for general prosecutors. But anyone who will be in that list, um, it will not be ready to, to go on a suicidal mission to save such an unpopular and illegitimate government. Because it, it makes no sense for, a, a, for, for someone who represents uh, a, one of the strongest civil service career in, in Brazil. It, it, it's, it's, and so, the, the, of course, a president, even a, a very unpopular uh, president, still has a lot of tools to remain in power. But uh, the tools are not so powerful as they were in the past under Sarney, for instance. We are living, this time is different. This is my point. It, this time is different because we have new actors in the game. Uh, the, the game is not under the control of the political elite, right? And the, the <coughs> political elite is, is, has not come to terms with this new reality. They still think they, they can control the game, but they cannot control the game any longer. And, and, and sooner or later, they will have a strong reality check. And the reality check will come, I think, from the judicial and branch, including 
the federal prosecutors. May I just point, uh, observe another point before you? May I? Yes, go ahead. Just considering the electoral court decision, and Paulo just mentioned the fact right now, well, even if they decide to withdraw the government next week, there will be an appeal. We don't know how long this appeal will take, how long the Supreme Court will take to make such a decision. This is the first point. We don't know about the time. The second point has to do with uh, which will be the uh, exactly the decision. Assuming that in the end, uh, the decision is to put Temer out. And so we have to find a new government. We know that the Constitution, the, the federal Constitution, establishes that we must have a, a nine direct election for, for, the, for the president in the last two years. <laughs> However, I read the, a recent decision concerning the, Amazon, the state of Amazon decide to, to, to enforce direct elections. Yeah. When one read the state Constitution, what the state Constitution establishes is that the speaker of the state assembly should be the replacement for the, uh, 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 for the former governor. In the case of the federal constitution, we have the indirect election in this case after a, a short period of the speaker of the house. But uh, some news say that the rapporteur will propose direct elections for the president if he has to leave the office in this in this period. And so we still have another element of uncertainty here. We don't know if we will have direct elections or indirect elections for the president. And this is a new element. And they, I'm sure that they won't come from a constitutional amendment. We don't have time, we don't have agreement, but they can come from a judicial decision. If, it's, if it doesn't come from the electoral court, perhaps it comes from the Supreme Court, and the, 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 the whole Supreme Court is much more innovative than this composition of the electoral court that, even though, decided in favor of direct elections for the Amazon. Thank you. And Matthew, did you want to say anything? I, I'll just uh, jump in a little bit to stake my claim uh, against Sergio a little bit. Um, and I, mm -hmm. I, I follow Giuliano because I think uh, there's an awful lot of wiggle room here for the TSE, for the Electoral Tribunal. You already mentioned the Dilma. It's, a, it's against Dilma and it's against Temer. Temer yeah. And you could already begin to see that there's an issue there. The other... Um, I think important uh, source of wiggle room is that the STF often overturns uh, the TSE. And that I agree that they would be under enormous pressure, but there are ways to do it that look Solomonic, that where you get a conviction, but you push off a decision. And, you know, when you look at the composition of the electoral tribunal, from the Supreme Federal tri uh, the, from the Supreme Court, you have Fuchs and Mendes, very, very capable political judges. Um, from the STJ, some fairly political, and then you have two political appointees in addition who wouldn't have gotten there if they didn't know how to play Brasilia. So I don't want to be too uh, pessimistic about how the TSC will work, but I would not be su surprised to see some sort of Solomonic decision. If, if, if I may, I think that they are not going to put a blind eye, definitely. Uh, so they are going to, to reach a condemnation. But we, we don't know what kind of condemnation it will be. So they can just separate uh, Dilma's campaign from Temer's campaign and put all the blame on PT because PT was in, in the head of the tickets. So they, ca they can do this. They can, we don't know. And also, w we can come to a situation in which uh, we know that we have seven judges and we can have a score like 6 to, to 0 to condemn and to remove Temer. But uh, Jumar Mendes can ask for Vista. And in that situation, we are not going to, to reach a decision. And, and Temer is going to, to be, be keep it in, in office. So we have many questions. And, and also, uh, uh, Claudio mentioned, uh, we can also have a decision uh, uh, calling for direct elections. Because uh, TSE... Uh, has this precedent regarding Amazonas, and they also can consider uh, not looking at the, this precedent, but they can just say that the campaign was so full of, of wrongdoing that they are not going to consider 
nor Dilma and, and Temer elected. And because of that, they are going just to ask for, for new elections in the country. They, they can decide it this way. So we have like many different scenarios. So it's, it's very hard to reach a, a, a common decision. All right, well, I think let's collect a few more questions. Um, there's two gentlemen in the middle. They've been waiting. Thank you. Uh, my name is Wilson Frott. I'm with the World Bank. Um, we have been talking a lot about what's going to happen in the next 18 to 24 months, but I, I can't help to wonder what, what are the long-term implications of that, of what's happening now. I mean, we have a society in Brazil now that is completely polarized, and anyone who is Brazilian who is a member of a family WhatsApp group knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> the coxinhas against the mortadelas. So I is democracy in Brazil going to come out of that stronger, or is just everybody now has a sense that no matter what my political bias, I can't have anybody in power who's going to be defending my interests? Okay, if you want to go great. ahead right now. Actually, it's a great segue for my question as well. My name is Matheus Estivalec, and... Uh, uh, I want to talk to to the whole panel, but about Mauricio's presentation and particularly the number. Uh, this jump out at me. Sixty-six percent of Brazilians believe that solving corruption is very important. So it is my belief that corruption is a systemic issue deep rooted in Brazilian society. Do you believe that we will see changes in the current political scenario, or will these changes come after ethical and moral values are instilled in children early on in their Brazilian household? Who would like to speak, Mauricio? Uh, for the first question, uh, as of today, there are polarized potential candidates for next presidential election. And on the, on the left, we have Lula, and on the extreme right, we have a figure like a congressman called ja Jair Bolsonaro. But I feel from the polls that people are looking for a kind of a center option uh, one of the potential center options is the mayor of Sao Paulo that I know Professor Claudio loves it. And <laughs> <laughs> the, the, guy that, the, the guy that called himself as a manager, not a politician. But, uh, but, uh, but, uh, but uh, f as of next year, I, I believe that if someone puts himself or herself as a, as a center option, it would be a favor to to win. Otherwise, we're going to have a very polarized election that would be very bad. I, I think uh, in a, a scenario in a second round, Lula against Bolsonaro would be very bad for, 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 for the country and would make much more like a polar situation for the public opinion. Talking about your question, um, that's, a, that's a deep question. I don't think the, what I'm seeing in the Brazilian population, uh, uh, Brazilian Brazilians have become more conservative overall. And, uh, and one of the explanations, and the, there's a lot of studies about that, and I see this every election cycle, is that the evangelicals are become a much larger uh, participants on, on the society. Uh, and, and that reflects on the Congress, reflects on the number of candidates, reflects on, on everything. And, and those kind of values are, are, are growing in, in terms of, of, of fighting the corruption in terms of being honest and there is studies that in 2050 half of the Brazilian population will be evangelical and uh, and that for me is a big change that's coming in terms of ethics and and the o o overall discussion did you want to speak I, I'll just chip in because Paulo uh, made me a fellow here. And uh, when I was a fellow here, I wrote a, uh, I began a manuscript that I'm still working on. I'm sorry, Paulo. Uh, <laughs> but, but, but this goes to the, the, the question of, you know, Paulo started by talking about the exhaustion of the system. And when I think about what that system is, it's a system that combines state capitalism with presi uh, coalitional presidentialism, but then also with a tradition of judicial impunity. And when you think about the reforms that have been done on the economic front, they don't really deal with some of the deeper issues of state capitalism. They're fiscal reforms, they're important, but they don't deal with the deeper sort of origins or the ideational commitment by citizens to this system, right? And I think on the political front, we've already discussed the difficulty of political reform. And in terms of judicial impunity, that has really dis been destabilized, but it still hasn't gone as far as it needs to. I mean. 
Sergio Moro is, is one judge, the, the Lava Jato task force is a very important task force, but there, you know, there are other judges and other prosecutors in Brazil. I, I'm not saying that there aren't other investigations. There are. But um, I, all I want to point out is that we're talking about a lot of incremental reforms, but so far no, there, there's no sort of proposal for a big bang that would just shake up the whole system. I, I guess there are some dis there's some discussion of a constitutional um, convention, but that would be far in the future, right? And then Monica wanted to comment? Yeah, I just want to echo Matthew's point on state capitalism. Um, he's absolutely right. The kinds of reforms that we're talking about, they're all fiscal. They're important. They're somewhat structural. I mean, social re security reform in the way that it was designed originally, not the way that it stands now, was meant to be structural. It's now no longer that. But there's, a, there's another issue here that we still haven't faced he head on, which comes through BNDS, the State-Owned Development Bank. We just saw last week the, the, president, the resignation of um, the president of BNDS, um, Maria Silva Bastos. She was actually doing a pretty ambitious transformation of the bank. Um, she had turned you know, the bank more technical again. She was basically stopping all of these credit operations without you know, proper oversight, um, technical oversight at least. And she was really thinking strategically about what the role of the bank going forward would be. Now, of course, that made part of the Brazilian private sector very, very angry because they no longer had access to cheap subsidized lending from the public sector. And the very fact that they got very angry was part and parcel of her ouster um, last week. So that tells you something about how the mindset, you know, even though there are some changes going on within Brazilian society, that particular aspect of, you know, how cozy the private sector is with the public sector, how dependent the private sector is on the public sector, that has not changed. And that has to change. Until that changes, I totally agree with Matthew. We're still going to have this same system that's going to perhaps reinvent itself in some other way, but the key elements of it will remain in place. All right, let's collect a few more questions from the audience. Ah, yes, the lady in back. Hi, my name is Melina. I'm from Fundação Getúlio Vargas. And my question is, uh, is the crisis deep enough to produce any systemic change in the system, in the political system? <laughs> Who would like to answer that one? Yes, Sergio? Be, but it clearly will not. It will be rather different from the landscape landscape we know today, and and that leads me to a comment to 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 the so-called polarization between the 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 PSDB camp and the PT camp. I think when we talk about this polarization, I think we are already talking about something of the past. This is wearing off uh, because. All the major politicians across the board are hit to a lesser or a greater extent by the Lava Jato investigation. Lula is doomed. Aécio is doomed. Uh, a guy like Geraldo Alckmin, although not uh, so tainted by the, the investigation as Aécio, is deeply hit also. So what will be of the PSDB in the future? It's not clear. It's not at all clear. Uh, Mauricio has said that there's ample room for a centrist candidate based on his on the surveys and polls that uh, his company conducts. But look, uh, I agree with him. But uh, make no mistake, the longer uh, Michel Temer stays in power, the greater the damage to any candidate that will come from the parties that uh, back 
uh, 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 Temer's government. So things are evolving rapidly here. And I think we're still tending to analyze the political dynamics looking at the, uh, the, the, the back mirror uh, and not looking forward. May I? Yes, please. Uh, I agree with uh, Sergio, and I would advise uh, uh, our friend in the audience that's impressed with the what's family WhatsApp uh, conversation. Uh, I am also uh, impressed with my family WhatsApp conversation, but I do know that they do not represent uh, Brazil, the present Brazil. I think that we are confusing what we see in our very small intellectual world uh, with uh, what's going on uh, with the real population. Uh, people don't care much about these coxinhas versus mortadela. Yeah. They don't care at all. Uh, what we have is some people who are paid to do that by PT and the unions and good, uh, some people who are members of the intelligentsia, uh, uh, who are very convinced of uh, their certitudes, but this does not represent, I don't know, 2%, 3% of the population. And the vast majority, they couldn't care less about yeah. this fight that we see in WhatsApp and Facebook every day. This is total delusion. This is not what Brazil is thinking about. Yeah, I, I entirely agree. Go ahead. No, I just want to put uh, another element. I am perhaps not so optimistic, again, like my friend Sergio Fausto, because... I'm optimistic? He's <laughs> very optimistic. <laughs> He believes that we have, we will have a renewal of the political system. I'm not so certain about that. No, 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 no. You're, you're misinterpreting my, my uh -huh. thoughts. I said that we are witnessing the destruction of the old political party system. Yeah. I, didn't say the... any, I didn't say anything about... Okay. Ah, okay, because this is the part I agree with him. We have to destroy, uh, 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 the total destruction of the former political system. But I can't see the emergence of real alternatives. I can't see the emergence of new organizations that can replace the old party system. Uh, well, we have many institutional uh, aspects of the former political system that uh, 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 refrain these new organizations to emerge. Well, for example, time in TV, time in radio to make political propaganda during the elections. They don't have enough time to present themselves. Ironically, in part, this was established to uh, reduce the party fragmentation, what's not so bad. On the other hand, it works to refrain new organizations to take the place of the older ones. And they can see in the next elections the emergence of the new organizations, new kind of leaders that will really replace the older ones with a new practice. This is the point. We are in this gridlock in which the, to, 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 to repeat President Cardoso the other day, quoting Gramsci, uh, the old was already dead, but the new was, uh, hasn't uh, 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 birthed yet. And so we, we live in this very ambiguous situation in which we don't have something to replace the old. And so I don't know if you have a, a, a disruptor at this moment to create something really new. Perhaps it takes longer than we are thinking now. Paulo, did you want to say a few words? No, I just, yeah, we're almost at the time. I just wanted to, Sergio, we are, don't, don't talk because we hear everything you say. <laughs> no, no, I just wanted to make a, a one thing that I know I'm going to go to a territory here that's normally not advisable, but I sense that there is something very indecent about Brazilian politics. It's like almost, it's pornographic, frankly. You yeah. don't know, you know what pornography, you don't need to define it, you, you know when you see it. I think Brazilian politics is raised to that level. Now, we don't talk about that because maybe are we afraid, and this is a question to you guys, is are we afraid of talking about decency because we are afraid that the evangelicals may have a monopoly on that issue and that we will be a moralistic something? Well, I'm not afraid of talking about it. I have, I, you know, we have to talk about it. The, the way you talk about your children, to your children or grandchildren. Do we talk to children and grandchildren in Brazil about the future of the country in terms that are understand? Because it's really 
what's happening in Brazil, what politicians are doing to the country is absolutely, not only unjustifiable, it's absolutely in, indecent. It's suicide, suicidal. Do we talk about that or are we too politically correct and are we too afraid of opening a, a, a window that the evangelicals, only the evangelicals, uh, because we'll talk about because we are too politically correct to talk about those things? Well, I, th I think that we are putting uh, the scandal every day in the, in the pages of the newspapers in Brazil. So I think that, yes, I think we are talking about that, but it's, it's kind of difficult for us to see uh, how, how to solve the system, as, as Mauricio, uh, uh, Mauricio uh, research show us that uh, people really want uh, the political reform in Brazil. But the, the, the government uh, presented us uh, a pension system reform, which is also important, which is also important for us. And if I may add another problem in Brazil, uh, every time uh, we have a new phase of car, car wash operation in Brazil, which is now in phase 41 or 42, I, I, I don't know precisely which phase is, is now because it's like two every week or one or two or maybe three every week and we are putting politicians and executives behind bars like every week and this is a good movement i think that we have to go forward i really support carroche operation i used to cover carroche operation in brazil i've been to curitiba now i'm trying to cover uh wha what is happening and the implications of carroche operation here in the united states but every time that we have an, a new a new phase of car wash operation, we have problems in the Congress to approve the reforms. And if I may, Monica, I think that we are going to a three three year consecutive of recession in Brazil. I agree. So we, we, if we go to to the last forecast of IMF, uh, it was a, a, a forecast of of GDP for Brazil 0.2 percent, considering that the pension reform was going to be approved and is not being approved anymore. Um, maybe we are going to have only the minimum wage approved. Maybe, maybe. So I think that we are going to a third year of recession and maybe a f to a fourth one. Yeah. Maybe to a fourth one. So it's, it's a tremendous crisis and it's very difficult to see a way out of this. All right. Well, I think given the time, I'm just going to ask each of our panelists for any closing thoughts that they might have on this discussion. Um, let me then start picking up on Juliana's point. I completely agree. I think that um, the depth of the crisis, the indecency, as, as Paulo mentioned, the, uh, you know, how it's been affecting people, how that's going to get reflected in 2018 in the elections, how that might get reflected in s things that we are not seeing. Because one thing that, you know, um, we keep saying this thing that but the old has died, but the new hasn't yet been born. But these are organic things that happen, right? We won't necessarily have the framework for seeing how the new is going to be born. These things happen organically as, you know, um, the situation evolves. I mean, look at the not wanting to make that kind of, it's not a parallel by any stretch of the imagination, but look at the Macron phenomenon in France. It took a year for that to happen. So, you know, there, there could be something like that in Brazil if indeed there is a demand um, on the part of the public for a centrist candidate. I don't necessarily subscribe to the idea that you need, um, you know, this kind of um, system whereby parties have, you know, political... Um, time on TV and so on and so forth in the age of, of social media. I just don't believe that anymore. I don't think that is the case. Um, I think that's past politics. That's 20th century politics. We still saw some of that in, tw in the 2014 elections. We're very unlikely to see that play out in the 2018 elections, in my view. But that's just, that's just an, a non-expert opinion um, based on stuff that I've been observing. Um, but back to the point on the recession, though, the situation is very, very severe, and it's severe enough to put everything back in paralysis for 
at least a couple of years to come. So yeah, it's not unthinkable that we will have, you know, this ongoing recession continue until there a, a time when actual leadership emerges in the country. So that's my my view where I want to end my remarks. I go to Sao Paulo, maybe Sergio. Can I? Uh, uh, <clears throat> I I will I will um, join Paulo and and um, let's say in saying there's a lot of indecency indecency here and but I will phrase it in a more sociological way. Um, what has happened in Brazil in the last 15 years? It, it suffice to take a look at the data regarding private donations uh, to, uh, to in elections. The total amount of private donations in elections, taking uh, um, comparing 2002 to, to, to 2014, have increased five times. And the, and the, the, the degree of concentration of, of, of these donations have also increased uh, in tandem. So there's uh, more money donated to private to private uh, to to political parties by fewer companies. Um, the level of concentration uh, was about 15. Uh, let's say the five major uh, donors in 2002 accounted for 15 percent of total donations. Uh, that number was above 30 percent. In, in, in 2014. This is a reflex of the, of the clear uh, uh, combination of an attempt to create state capitalism here, uh, to reinforce it, and to combine it with the electoral and democratic system. That's why the, 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 the system corrupted itself to an extent that had has no precedent in the in, in 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 the past. This is a totally new phenomenon, and that phenomenon is being reviewed by the Carl Lava Jato investigation. So when the, when the king is naked, it cannot. Uh, there is no way to rewind the tape. I, I it, so it's the total destruction of this system. It's hard to tell what. What will the future, the features of the new system will be? But I agree entirely with with Monica. The new political system that will emerge, the new parties, the new uh, forms of representation, will not be a reflex image of the 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 the, the world we know, and the the political least elite. Uh, um, are lost because they cannot adjust rapidly to the need to do to this new societal reality that will prevail sooner or later. So there will be a bumpy road ahead, uh, but uh, things will not be as it as they were in 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 the in the in the in the past that, in the world that we know. Well, just to put my final remarks and to have some controversial about this point about the importance of the traditional ways of making politics, just to finish. Uh, my point is that, well, I would, I would like to agree with you about this, that we have a new kind of policy that could be made and we have the emergence of new things, but I don't think that's going to happen. And considering the last uh, municipal elections, we have exactly these. Uh, PT was harshly defeated in the elections, but the new uh, uh, winners of the, these elections are the old parties. And probably it seems that the same rules will uh, frame the next presidential and congressional elections. It's very difficult to have something so differently emerging from that if the supply side of the political system will be the same. And so nothing changes, the rules are the same, it's very difficult to emerge something really new. And just to, to, to finish, we don't have too much time, uh, and I, I would like also to disagree with Paulo's observation that uh, we can compare the Brazilian political system with a pornographic thing. I think that's unfair with the porn industry because <laughs> uh, people can work honestly there and so it's totally different. Okay, thank you. <laughs> and who would like to go for, next? For, for the women of <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Carlos Eduardo, did you have any final remarks? No, no. Thank you very much. I, I, I believe we will, we will emerge as a better country <laughs> after all this. I do believe. And the question, when, when we emerge, no, that's... Uh, I just want to. I just want to conclude that uh, for next year, I think in, in talking the technological terms, I think the front end of the candidates would be different, but the back end would be the same. Uh, so all, all going to be the same political parties with the same agenda, but the next year the narrative would be the outsider's narrative. So every candidate, especially in, in majority elections like the presidency and the state uh, governors <laughs> candidates, would be saying that. They are, they, they are outsiders, they are not politicians, they are managers, they, don't, they, they, are, they, out, they are seeing everything that's happened from outside. So ch next year will be, the, will be the, the outsider's narrative. And we are seeing that already in the case of the mayor of Sao Paulo, that in, in a daily basis he says he's a manager, not a politician. We see this in the presidential candidate Jair Bolsonaro that says he doesn't, he doesn't relate with everything that is happening. So. And still, Brazil, 2018, would be the year of the outsiders. Oh, this, the different front end, but the same back end. Julian, Matthew. Yep. Well, uh, uh, I, I would like to end with a quote of Nelson Jobim, who is a contender to become maybe the president of Brazil. Uh, I interview many Brazilians, ma many politicians. It's amazing how they came here to the U.S., so I've been in three Dilma's events, two Sergio Moro events, one of the prosecutors like Deltan Dallagnol, I interviewed Ciro Gomes, Marina Silva, but it, it came from Nelson Jobim, I think the, the most impressive quote of all these interviews of more than 25 people that came from, from Brazil here to, to talk about the destiny of our country. And he said uh, that uh, Judicial decisions are not going to build our future. The uh, judicial decisions are concerned with the past. So I think that is, is something that we, we really have to think about it because I really support car wash operation, but car wash operation is talking about what happened in, in the past years of Brazil. But to move on, to go forward, we need to organize ourselves. And, and I'm really afraid of populism in Brazil. Uh, I talked to some American friends here, and they have one hope that after uh, being experienced the populism here in America, they are, are never going to vote anymore for something like that. Uh, but my afraid is that in Brazil, after all the things that we are passing through uh, in in 2019, we may experience some populism. I'm really afraid of that, really afraid of that. And, and then we are going to have some years to, to take over and, and to rebuild our political system. OK, I think that wraps up our session. Paulo, did you want to say any closing remarks? Just to thank you again for being here and to ask you to stay tuned. We have a few discussions coming and we are going to insist on our rule of law initiative. We are going to have uh, two ministers from the uh, labor uh, court in Brazil here on uh, June the 13th. Uh, we are going also to have uh, Justice uh, Luis Roberto Barroso with us on September the 8th, and we will have probably events in Brazil will, will justify us convening against this group and a good audience like yourselves to debate uh, what we are going to do there. Uh, I, s I tend to believe that there will be new events and that the <laughs> situation uh, that will uh, that will change. I have a very difficult time believing that we are going to go through a year and a half of uh, the Sarney type of uh, 
you know, uh, mass. Uh, I think the country is different. The country has experienced different things since then. There is a very high demand for justice in Brazil. I believe, and I completely agree with Juliano, you know, and what uh, Mauricio mentioned in the post. You ask people about uh, prosecution of corruption, it is of uh, an unanimity in Brazil. I think it's last time you asked directly the question. First time was 92%, and then we keep car washing going no matter what. And actually, you have now uh, understanding that the new Attorney General, the new Minister of Justice, uh, is there. Mm -hmm correctly uh, to defend Tamar, it's not to the, in the interest of the country apparently, but uh, he says that uh, he supports car wash because the moment you do not support car wash, the, 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 process, the, the investigation on federal criminal uh, 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 activity uh, related to Petrobras and to all the related things, the construction companies, big corruption, it is deemed as the biggest corruption case in the history of corruption. Uh, when you ask that question, Brazilians consistently tell people we are in support of this, go ahead, we'll pay the price. So <laughs> stay tuned. <laughs> we, we'll keep doing this, we'll keep doing, and uh, uh, we welcome uh, you here and we will put out a report on this, uh, on this uh, conversation. I, I wanted to thank you on Anya's behalf, on Michael's uh, behalf, our uh, current uh, intern from Yale University, uh, and Colton Wade also from Georgetown. Uh, we will keep going, and uh, as you know, Brazil is not the only country in the world facing uncertainties and difficult times. Thank you very much and good day. <laughs>